elephants are eating machines. <laughs> so they don't have like natural predator. So what they do every day is trying to look for food. So they eat like 200 kilograms a day. The world, and particularly China, has been captivated by a herd of wild Asian elephants who left southern China's Shi Shuang Buna National Reserve in March last year. They've slowly made their way north across Yunnan province, recently skirting Kunming, the home of this year's COP15 Biodiversity Conference, to be held in October. This herd may now be turning back, but it turns out that this is not the first time that elephants have left reserves in the south. Actually, back to 1990s, we observed that elephants started to disperse. But this kind of long distance movement, over 500 kilometers, I think, we have never ever seen this in human history. Becky Xu Chen, like the elephants, is from Yunnan province. She's also a member of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature Asia Elephant Specialist Group. She's keen to make clear exactly what's going on here. The movement of the elephants is not migration, it's the dispersal. So why migration is something that the animal go from A place to the destination B place. But actually, so this animal is going to somewhere, they don't know the direction and they don't have a destination. So you only will call this dispersal. So elephants, they are large animal. It means they need a big house and they need to eat a lot, like 200 kilograms a day. So back to 1970s, so elephants, they are only in, uh, living inside the strictly protected national nature reserves and outside are all surrounded by rubber plantations because elephants love tropical areas, but actually these areas are also very good for plantations. But today, of elephants' population doubled. We have 293 elephants now, which means that they need more spaces and they need more food to eat. So since 1990s, elephants started to roam out from reserves and something interesting happened. When they're going outside of the reserve, they eat the maize, bananas and the rice, and they find this kind of human food are more delicious and has more nutrients. So the Chinese scientists, they just discovered. So for the elephants in Southern China, they prefer the mixture of the landscapes to the intact forest. It means half natural forest, but in combination with other human settlements, human uh, agriculture land or human plantations. So actually, even you have very good forests, they don't stay. <laughs> they can easily go out to have easier access to more delicious food. But that's not very good if you're a farmer. Yeah, it's not very good for the farmers. So farmers experienced the human elephant conflict since 1990s. I think they suffered as well. But since, uh, I think since early 2000s, China also introduced the compensation scheme, trying to offset the farmer's loss to the crop breeding. So when there is human elephant conflict, that compensation, is it easy to claim for farmers? Yeah, the compensation yeah. is easily accessible to the farmers, but saying that's a traditional compensation, so you cannot really pay for the loss according to the market value. So people get some compensation, but still they are, yeah, they are losing the money. Yeah, compare uh, with the fact that they can sell <laughs> the products to the real market price. You made a distinction between a migration and a dispersal. Are these elephants just following the food? I think so, actually. The elephants are eating machines. <laughs> so they don't have like natural predator. So what they do every day is trying to look for food. So they eat like 200 kilograms a day. So they spend like 18 hours trying to find the food. So I think they just follow the like open area. For example, if you look into the movement routes, you can see they are along the open area near the roads because on the side of the roads, it's almost like flat area with more open spaces and with like a more agricultural land. The compensation scheme was never designed to deal with a dispersal like this though, which makes it very challenging for the government because obviously no one wants to see these elephants harmed in any way. Actually elephants will be the priority for trans governments and for trans people. So I think they will try the best to find a way to yeah, coexist with this large animal. So what's the likelihood of getting these elephants who've roamed so far to return to their home? Well, this is very difficult. And 
I think this is not even up to human's decision. It's animal's decision. So that's something we always think we plan out something for the animal, but you really find out the animals are not thinking the way humans thinking are thinking. Mm -hmm. So there could be some chance, like elephants, they have very good navigating system. So maybe they can find a way back, but maybe they were prefer to stay. But say they prefer to stay near an urban area or a highly farmed area, what's going to be the outcome? Because that's not going to be sustainable for the human population. Yeah, it will not be sustainable, especially we think one of the biggest challenge to conserve elephants is human elephant conflicts. So if elephants they get into the new area, so with the communities who have never seen them before, there could be something unexpected happen. For example, if people they don't know how to get along with elephants, if they meet with elephants in the narrow pass, elephants will injure them or even kill people. So in the history of China, I think more than 60 people lost their life to elephants. So it's not easy to say you can use in the composition scheme to pay for yeah, the human's life. So this can dramatically reduce the tolerance about elephants. So this is what we don't want to, want to say. Yes, that would be terrible if there was a death at any stage due to this dispersal. Yeah, but right now, so I think general public, they are very supportive and you can see that um, people really love elephants and even he, if you see like Weibo or WeChat articles and the people are like preparing food, like the farmers. Like right now elephants are in Yiman of Yuxi and the farmers, they are worried that the elephants, they are starving because they come to the new climate zone, like totally different landscapes. So they are like voluntarily gather the bananas, <laughs> crops together, trying to give the governments to feed the elephants. Yeah, but if something happens, it's amazing. People may not tolerate elephants anymore. So this could be very detrimental. Elephants were designated as a class one protected species as far back as 1988, with penalties of up to 10 years in prison for killing one. Do you think the migration is going to help raise awareness of the need to conserve these animals worldwide? Yes, I think. Yeah. So, for example, back to 10 years ago, I started to work on elephants and I did some surveys about the general public. And maybe only 3% of the people I surveyed, they knew about human-elephant conflicts. <laughs> and whenever I went to conference and the people were shocking that we had elephants in China, they didn't know that before. <laughs> So I think, yeah, because of this event, it's more like a wake-up call so that more people are getting to interested in elephants. So they start to develop certain emotional connection with elephants, as you can see in the picture behind me. Yes. <laughs> so it's very yeah. popular. And the people don't know actually elephants, they are lying down to sleep. And they are also like family. So I think if we get those kind of emotional bond, so people will more care about the species. You know, they make me think about the guy hypothesis, you know, the idea that the world is one organism and it will eventually correct itself. So it seems almost spooky that they made their way to Kunming, the home of this year's biodiversity conference. It, it's almost like they're bringing a message. Yeah, it's a message. So yeah, we can see a lot of people are posting that, oh, elephants are attending the COP15 that will be held in Kunming in October. So I hope that this movement, although it's also a challenge sto story, I would not say it's a sad story, but a challenge story, but I hope that this can really wake up people to look into the issue. And also for the COP15 will be held in Kwame, this time they added like one more target in the framework, the human wildlife coexistence. So I think the visit of elephants to wake up people to look into these issues because so we have, we hope to have growing animals. This is what we want to want to see. Like China only have 300 elephants. So we want to have more elephants. We want more elephants to establish new populations. We hope that the elephants can recover the populations in their historical range. But it's also very challenging how they can coexist with people because limited land, you have the increasing urbanization as well. So how you can have an animal, but also having happy people, this could be a challenge task that all the scientists together with governments, with NGOs need to work together to find the answer. 
and for the elephants, for example, I think many farmers they also suffer it because whatever they grow, elephants will eat them. <laughs> so it's not sustainable. So how to come up with alternative, alternative livelihoods is one of the key questions. Especially for those rubber plantations, it's already so yeah. old. So actually, yeah. the rubber cannot generate the income anymore. Yeah, and at the same time, the market price for rubber collapsed. So maybe this is just opportunities for, for us to think about the core management plan, whether we can return this rubbers back to the elephants. The elephants are also reminding us of something that the pandemic has already taught us, that we need to make space for the wild, that we need to have buffer zones between wild populations and human populations. Yeah, I agree. So, so China established the Panda National Park, and then Snow Leopard National Park, and I know that the Asian Elephant National Park is already sitting there in that proposal. So as you mentioned, we need a buffer zone, but things to run by now because it's so it's a great land, like a lowland tropical region. So it's good for economy and it's also very good for biodiversity. So how to come up with a plan to help the elephants to live there and how to also help the communities to live there. I think it's very important issues to look into. You mentioned the snow leopard and panda parks. Did that involve buying land back off local people? I would say it's like a coal management. So you still have communities living inside the national park. For example, I went to Qinghai National Park and they found the Tibetan villages living inside. So they still manage their land, but they still have the snow leopard on the backyard. So I think for the national park, just coming up to with some strategies, how to help the communities to develop livelihoods that not threatening the animal and at the same time how to help them to, to, um, to get the offset from protecting this animal. Well, we're learning, aren't we, that we're going to need to put at least 30% of our land and oceans into reserves if we're going to protect our biodiversity. And it's clear that China is keen to step in this direction, hosting the Biodiversity Conference, and especially with the realization that we're getting to the point of no return. Yes, the leadership, I think. China advocates on the ecological civilization. So I think this is the one of the great case studies to show that how we can move towards the civil yeah, the ecological civilization. Ah, oh, it's finished. But don't worry, we've got a lot more Razor stories for you. All you need to do is like, comment and subscribe and hit the bell button below for notifications. We'll see you next time.